I am sure that there must be things uh, in, let's say, Jewish apocalyptic that have antecedents in Egyptian texts sure. or Egyptian mythology or Egyptian religion. I just don't know much about Egyptian texts, but I'll, I'll bet so. You know, if you can look at the Bible and find things that come from Ugarit, I, I, there must be things from Egypt. There are common myths and, 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 and stories. You know, God coming and visiting Abraham in uh, chapter 18 of Genesis, that sounds like some of the Greek stories where Zeus comes down or Zeus and Hera come down and the people are hospitable to them and don't know who they are and then they, they disappear and then they realize afterwards who they were. So if you can find something like that, let's say in, in old Indian or Hindu mythology, I'd probably just say it's an old European, Indo-European story. It, this may be really, really old, yeah. right? I, I, you know, you, I don't think anything was sealed off. Um, some people have a, uh, have once in a while suggested that maybe there are some Buddhist motifs in the New Testament. And you know what? It's not impossible, right? right? Uh, some people have argued that Plato has some of his ideas from the East. Okay. Philo from Alexandria he has a chapter in his writings called who is the divine heir of all things and in this chapter he talks about God being I think he says triune nature nature of three and then he says that the the uh the, the divine heir of all things is the logos the word uh -huh. so the question is do you think that his ideas sort of made its way into Christian theology well, that's a that's a lovely question. Um, there there is a a discussion as to how how wide known Philo was uh, in the first century, but there's also a question of how much of Philo is Philo and how much of Philo mm -hmm. is his own tradition. That is, to what extent is he repeating things that he's learned or expanding things that that right. he has learned. Now, you are right. If you look at what Philo has to say about the Logos, it is strikingly similar to a lot of things the early Christians uh, say about Jesus. And there's obviously some connection there. I'm not inclined to think that Paul is reading Philo. I may be wrong, but I don't think so. I doubt that the Gospel of John is reading Philo or the, the author is reading Philo. But I think they reflect a common Jewish philosophical stream. And I think that there are these, these ideas about uh, the logos and, and the word and how the world was created and how, how the transcendent manifests itself eminently and so on. And I think these ideas are with the early Christians plugged into Jesus and they are categories that are already there, which help them to unfold uh, the meaning that they see in Jesus. So I think we could say pretty confidently that Jesus at least thought of himself as the Messiah, but possibly also maybe even more than that, maybe even just being actually the son of God and having some sort of divinity. You think that's fair to say? <laughs> so that's a real difficult one. And I've never, never quite been comfortable coming to uh, decisions about what Jesus might have meant by son of God, uh, if he used the, the term, which he doesn't um, very often. But I, I would say two things. I think that the son of God language originates in Davidic Christology. So if you go back to Second Samuel 7, there's a promise about David's son who will build a temple and God will be his father and he will be God's son. Now, the, the fulfillment of that in the text itself would seem to be Solomon, but Jews read that as being fulfilled, not just in Solomon, but this would also be uh, the Messiah or Redeemer figure in the latter days and, and so on. And I am just uh, certain that if you look carefully at the New Testament, that you can see at points where Son of God language is messianic language and that means it's divinic language if you just think of mark's trial narrative um you know he said he said that he's going to tear down the temple right he's going to tear down the temple and then raise one in three days so he's going to destroy the temple and he's going to build a temple that's immediately followed by well do you think you're the son of god 
So it's a non sequitur. It's just yeah. it's a non sequitur unless you have this Davidic idea in mind that the son of God is going to build the temple or the temple builder is going to be God's son. So there are places like that in the New Testament where I'm sure that Davidic Christology is the background for uh, son of God. Then the question becomes, well, how transcendent did some Jews think the Messiah was going to be? Did they think the Messiah was going to be just some some guy like you know, David who's going to walk into town one day and say we're taken over? Or is this some heavenly figure who's superhuman and, and so on? I think there is evidence in some Jewish texts that there were very high ideas of uh, Messianic Christology. So that's one part of this thing. The second thing I probably shouldn't share, but um, I discovered a number of years ago that um, that the idea of of a heavenly twin is a fairly uh, well attested idea in the ancient world. That is the idea that your soul uh, actually somehow exists also in the heavens and that you have a twin in the heaven or your real self is somehow uh, in the heavens. And uh, what I argued in one of my books very tentatively, very tentatively, is that it's, it's possible that when Jesus used this son of man language in the third person, which he always does, it's the third person, uh, that he may in effect be talking about his heavenly double or his heavenly self uh, who is going to descend and so on. Now that's highly speculative, but it was a way for me to wonder how could a first century Jew have had such a highfalutin concept of himself? That is, I'm trying to think not in fourth century Nicene terms. That is, Jesus is not a fourth century Christian. He's not operating with right. the categories of the later creeds and the church fathers. But if he has a self-high conception, how could how could that have worked in the first century? And I just speculated. I, I would never build anything on it. But um, wh whatever you do, it's got to be a first century concept. All right. Right. Th that's that's one of the, the things I was exploring just because I thought, you know, from the beginning, from what I can tell, everybody thinks Jesus is a really big deal. Right. Right. And the very first Christian source we have is First Thessalonians. And the guys coming on the clouds of heaven, you know, at, at the end of time. This is the, the central guy. And he's the guy back, uh, he's the guy back uh, in Daniel 7. You know, you, you, Daniel 7 is really odd because you have the Ancient of Days and then the one like uh, uh, Son of Man. And the Son of Man in Daniel 7 rides on the clouds. Only God rides on the clouds in, in the Old Testament. Wow. And people who are experts in the ancient Near East look at this and say, you know, this is a little like Ugaritic myth where the, the old God gives way to the, the new God. And, uh, you know, maybe these really highfalutin ideas are, are out there. These, these ideas of um, exalted human beings are there. If you look at, just to give you uh, one example uh, there's a text from the Dead Sea Scrolls called 11Q Melchizedek. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it seems to be the guy who's back in Genesis who meets Abraham. And, yep. uh, you know, it doesn't last very long. It's a very short seed. But th there's all text about this guy. And he's the judge uh, of the last day. And he's the redeemer of Isaiah uh, 61. And he actually is called Elohim. And you know, probably doesn't mean deity, but it's it's really interesting, right? Yeah. Um, and, then, and you tell that to Hebrews, where it talks about the order of Melchizedek being yeah, a, yeah. a type of Christ. So the guy in Hebrews is not inventing this. There's actually some right. sort of dialogue that grows out of Genesis about who is this mysterious fellow there. And you actually have a whole text in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, we don't have the whole thing. It's in fragments. It's in pieces. Uh, but there's a whole book about this guy, uh, apparently, right? Yeah. Later on, later on, also, you get uh, you get something like Third Enoch, which is a later Jewish text. But it, it's, it's so confusing because there's a guy in there uh, called uh, Metatron. Uh, and he's, his name is Little Yahweh. 
So I, I actually tell people now I'm completely confused about uh, Jewish conceptions of God uh, back then because I was raised with the old view that, you know, we had polytheism, then we had henotheism, that is, you know, uh, Yahweh was the, you know, the chief God, but there were other gods. And then finally with Isaiah or somewhere along the line, you get true monotheism where the other gods, maybe they don't even exist, right? And Judaism after that is monotheistic. But um, I'm, I'm not sure anymore. You know, there are people like uh, Daniel Boyarin, the Jewish scholar, who thinks the Trinitarian uh, doctrine is is Jewish? I mean, there's nothing un-Jewish uh, about this thing. So at this especially, point in my especially with, especially with how Philo views the, the the Jewish God, I mean that's falls right in line. Well, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly what's going on with Philo, but uh, it's not ju just Philo uh, where you have these uh, these major figures. There's also a text known as uh, Ezekiel the Tragedian, and we don't have the whole thing, but it's a pre-Christian text. It's from Alexandria, and it's truly strange. Um, so in this text, uh, at one point, there's a vision, and Moses is, so God's on the throne, and God leaves the throne. Moses sits on the throne of God. Moses holds the staff of the universe. Moses counts the stars, you know, who, by the way, who gets, who can count the stars? You know, only God and right. the angels come down and they bow before Moses. Now this is a vision. It's a dream vision. So you could say, well, it's all symbolic, but it's really weird, isn't it? What kind of thought is going on behind here? There's also speculation that comes out of of the book of Exodus, you might remember there are a couple of points in which God says uh, to Moses, you will be God to Pharaoh, you will be Theos to Pharaoh. What a weird, you know, what does that mean exactly? But then you get um, really highfalutin pictures of Moses uh, later on. So sure. the point here is that I think I was trained just to think that monotheism, Jewish monotheism was just a flat static concept. And this early Christian stuff is so weird and doesn't fit. So maybe even it has to come from, um, you know, Greek mythology or something like that. But I think the Jew, you know, so I, I wouldn't deny influence from the Greek world, but the Jewish texts are strange enough sure. uh, for me right now. And, and this should have been obvious anyway, because the earliest Christians are all Jews. Right. So if they're doing all this stuff, this must be a possibility for Jews, however you you explain it, right? Yeah, and I think another call, thing, yep. I think another thing that we, we 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 tend to do is we tend to we tend to put a big border over Israel and the ancient Roman world, and all the ideas in, in there don't get out, and all the ideas from the Roman Empire don't get into Israel, and they're separate. But, but it's like they probably borrow from each other. You no, know, that's just the way that's just the way human culture is, right? People are right. borrowing from each other uh, from each other all the time. Uh, I am sure, for example, I've always been sure, but I don't have the ability to to look into this. I am sure that there must be things uh, in, let's say, Jewish apocalyptic that have antecedents in Egyptian texts sure. or Egyptian mythology or Egyptian religion. I just don't know much about Egyptian texts, but I'll, I'll bet so. You know, if you can look at the Bible and find things that come from Ugarit, uh, there must be things from Egypt. And, uh, you know, there are common myths and, 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 and stories, uh, you know, God coming and visiting Abraham in uh, chapter 18 of Genesis. That sounds like some of the Greek stories where Zeus comes down or Zeus and Hera come down and the people, you know, um, uh, are hospitable to them and don't know who they are. And then they, they disappear and then they realize afterwards who they were. Um, for all I know, some of this stuff may go way back to uh, Philemon. How do you say Philemon? Is that say uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis has a story just like that, where Philemon and Bacchus, uh -huh. same story. They had the gods. It's Hermes, I think it is Hermes and Dionysus. I think one of the two, but they go and visit these people, and they're in disguises as mortals, and they treat them very well, and all this, and they don't, don't realize that this was the gods they were treating. But yeah, yeah. there's there's the, another example. You know that's. These ideas so, are, are being 
thrown around throughout the entire world. Well, so if you could find that text, if you could find something like that, let's say in, in old Indian or Hindu mythology, I'd probably just say it's an old European, Indo-European story. It, this may be really, really old, yeah. right? Uh, but anyway, the point is that um, it doesn't, I, I, you know, you, I don't think anything was sealed off. Um, some people have a, uh, have once in a while suggested that maybe there are some Buddhist motifs in the New Testament. And you know what? It's not impossible, right? right? Uh, some people have argued that Plato has some of his ideas from the East. Okay. Yeah, this, it seems like the cynics, the Greek cynics, have a lot in common with the, the Buddhists in the East. There's a lot of uh, overlap going on there. But um, th just because we have a couple minutes left, I want to get to this last question I want to ask you about. Okay. And uh, by the way, this has been great so far. I'm really enjoying this. But um, the last question I have is about some people like to bring their naturalist views on these events, like the resurrection, saying that people hallucinated or Jesus had a twin brother. This is all a magic trick or that he drank this wine and got passed out. He looked like he was dead, but he wasn't. What are your responses to some of this stuff? Uh, well, again, that's a very large topic. Yeah. I'm not sure how to deal with that very uh, in, in brief compass. Um, so look, I guess, I guess what I could say is this, uh, I'm not a skeptic. I've made, you know, I'm not hidden that I, you know, I'm a religious guy. I have some religious beliefs and I'm not a flat earth materialist, but if I were a flat earth materialist, and if I were a skeptic, I think the best explanation for resurrection belief in the early Christianity would be this, and it would consist of three parts. It would consist, first of all, of an empty tomb. And I don't think you need God to have an empty tomb. There is enough literature from the ancient world on tomb robbery and on using uh, body parts in recipes for this and that. There's enough stuff on, on the stealing of bodies that I would postulate that. And then I would say that Mary followed by Peter, Mary Magdalene followed by Peter, uh, had a vision or hallucinated Jesus. And then what I would say is that since Jesus operated with, in my view, an eminent eschatology, since he thought of the, the final things as near, what they did is they interpreted these things in eschatological terms. That is, this must mean that the resurrection of the dead has begun, the end is near, and, and so on, all right? Uh, I think that's the, the simplest idea. The idea that Jesus you know, maybe somebody snuck him some wine and, you know, he, he cocked him out and there was a sort of plot. There are there are five books, uh, you know, where Pilate is in on it or Joseph of Arimathea is in on the plot and, you know, they want to do this or that. Um, that just seems like pure fiction to me. You can't prove a negative, but I don't see any reason uh, to think this. Or the, the idea that maybe Jesus survived his crucifixion um uh, well I, you know can't disprove it on the other hand the sense the overwhelming sense you get from the early christian sources is not that this guy survived crucifixion the sense that you get is they they think he's beaten death somehow right and that he's victorious and he lives in another world and um Look, again, if you're a skeptic, you can do this with, with visions, all right? You, you don't need this, this, this other stuff. And the twin thing, uh, you know, so, so when I looked into this, I think I only found one person who had proposed it, and it was only half serious. Maybe you know of more people who are into this now, uh, but it, it just seems like, again, how could, how could you disprove it? Um, so. You, you could theorize that uh, aliens were watching the crucifixion and they said, guys, we, we would like some social psychological data on these human beings. We don't know much about them. So let's have one of us, uh, you know, dress up like this guy who just died. We'll, we'll take him out of the tomb, bury him, and they will pretend that we're him and we'll see what happens. This will be a really interesting religious ex experiment. Well, there's no evidence to disprove this, is there? 
Good point. No, but I'm guessing you could spin stories like this uh, all, all the time. So what you want to do if you're trying to explain something historically is you want to look for um, the most historical analogies. So again, if you're a skeptic, you're, you, you're going to say, well, I know people do have visions. It's not that uncommon. Uh, some of these visions are of the newly departed, right? And if you're a skeptic, you think that all of those visions are projections. We do have data about tomb robbery from the ancient world, right? We, we do. It's there. So we know what happened. And we know Jesus was an eschatological prophet. So you put those three things together. That's what I would think if I, if I were a, a skeptic. Now, I'm not a skeptic. One of the, the, the things that some people find difficult to believe is I don't think all visions are hallucinations, for example. So to call something a vision for me doesn't settle it. Uh, I, I, we, we need to do further talking about that. Anyway, so um, actually, skeptical view is not that far from my view. So my view is that the tomb was empty. I'm not sure why. Uh, I think the disciples saw Jesus, and I'm okay with that being veridical. And I think they interpreted everything in terms of eschatology. So um, sure. uh, I, I, I just have, I suppose, a different, uh, a different set of metaphysical or ontological presuppositions, and lots of people do. Yeah, no, that's that's fair, and that's everyone has their their own way of looking at things. With that being said, with your with you you know you putting out that that's what you believe, would you consider this Jesus dying, whether he resurrected or not, and you think he did, or do you think that the fact that a couple centuries go by, and all of a sudden he's becoming the focus of the entire world, do you think that alone is a good reason to believe that this is somewhat this there's truth behind this thing? No. That's just a so, social psychological fact. Uh, look, I don't believe the truth always wins. And I, I think bad ideas often triumph. So that something triumphs doesn't mean anything. Sure. Right? Um, wow. All you have to do, let's see how I phrase this so I don't offend anybody. Okay, we can just put it this way. Uh, if, if you're on the left, you can't believe all the people on the right who have horrible ideas. And if you're on the right, you can't believe all those people on the left who have these horrible ideas, right? So um, wherever you are, all sorts of people have terrible ideas. I'm actually of the view that people on the far left and far right both have lots of terrible views and that we, we just got lots of nutty ideas here. Um, but, but, but the point is that um, I'm cynical about human beings, so I would never want to say that, what, you know, you sort of have a vote for the truth through popularity. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. I agree. No, bad. That's bad. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you.